Welcome, I'm joined today by David Reich, the board chair for the Quincy Climate Action Network, who is, we are very excited to be partnering with for a special program with Dr. Zig Platter. Uh, Dr. Platter, Zig, is the, uh, works at Boston College Law School and was the chair of the State of Alaska Oil Spill Commission's Legal Research Task Force investigating the Exxon Valdez spill. Uh, and he's gonna talk to us about uh, his experiences there and lessons that we can learn. So, Zig, David, thank you so much for joining me today. It's really an honor and a pleasure to, to talk with you. Thanks for having us. David, perhaps you could say a couple words about, you know, how you met Zig and how the Quincy Climate Action Network uh, is excited to work with him and to talk about this issue today. I'm, I met Zig actually through uh, uh, my uh, professional work as a uh, reporter for uh, uh, Boston College Law Magazine. And I've had the pleasure uh, of interviewing Zig a number of times. And... Uh, and uh, came to learn uh, recently about his work with the uh, uh, Alaska um, investi uh, state investigation of the uh, Exxon uh, oil spill and uh, his characterization of the uh, uh, problems leading up to and, uh, and, and immediately following uh, the oil spill and uh, and his identification of, of what he calls iron triangles uh, as the, the ultimate source of, uh, of the problems that made the oil spill um, uh, almost inevitable and uh, that also uh, made the cleanup uh, much less successful uh, than it could have been. Um, and uh, it occurred to me that uh, some of the same um, forces are operating today uh, as we confront the climate crisis. And I thought uh, Sig could take uh, some of his wisdom acquired uh, in the Alaska situation and apply it to what we're facing today. I, I really gr am grateful that you made the introduction for us, David, and that uh, the, the local climate action network is interested in helping us learn from the resources that we have here so we can figure out what we can do going forward. Zig, thanks for joining us. How did you, uh, so you obviously did this work, it was over 20 years ago, the Exxon Valdez spill was, how long ago was it now? 1989. 1989. But I got a call from Alaska because one of my old students uh, when I was teaching at Harvard was up in Alaska and they had to handle this massive oil spill and didn't have anybody ready to hand. So he said, well, why don't you call my professor? And so I called and was delighted to, to take on that job because it was clear it was a milestone in environmental history. And it was interesting because when I talked with David about it, you have to know many journalists don't have the smarts that David has. And so when he asked me to come to this Quincy session, I said, ah, yes, I know it will be an interesting session. Um, but the idea is that we are in the midst now of really remarkable crises. The, the climate crisis and the COVID-19 crisis, sometimes when you go back in time to a milestone case, you can see things maybe a little bit more clearly. And, and so that's what David suggested, that, that we go back in history to that case that my students and I got deeply involved with and see what it can tell us about today. That makes a lot of sense. Um, David was talking about iron triangles, and I know that term may be new. It's, it's, a, it's a phrase that I haven't heard described in that way, so I'm excited to get to that. But I know that you share, you have a couple images that um, to help us appreciate just a kind of small sample of what you're going to talk about at this program. So maybe you want to go ahead and share your screen and we can look at those because I know we were looking at them just a little bit ago before we turned on the recording and Iron Triangles comes up a little bit later in that. So here we are. This is, I, these, so these are samples of the, some of the slides that you'll be sharing in the program. 
Um, so we're not going to spend a lot of time. There's going to be certainly things that come up on these slides, I'm sure, that we're not going to go into detail right now. Uh, people will have to attend the program to, to learn the details, but this will give people a sense. So these are your students from Alaska. But this, actually, these are students from Boston, uh, ah, okay. from Harvard and from BU, BBC. How did I make that mistake? Um, because the budget for the commission wasn't very great. And so I said, I need free labor, no credit, no money, uh, <laughs> five people. And I got 17 people uh, who, wow. who worked through the commission. What we're looking at is the, the, the landscape. The dotted line is the tanker route okay. from Valdez down to Long Beach, uh, Los Angeles, where the oil um, is refined and you know the difference between single hulled and double hulled tans, tan tankers is that right well i would assume the difference is one hole uh you <laughs> and which do you think is safer single safer? or double i would assume if i was doing a belt and suspenders versus just a belt that the belt and suspenders would be a better approach so i would assume that the double hole would also likewise be a better approach a safer you approach. got it these ships were longer than three football fields and the oil was separated from the ocean by an inch and an eighth of steel. Just one hole. It isn't rusty. Wow. And, and so that's part of the story too uh, because the president of the United States was pressured by a corrupt decision not to have double hull tankers, which would have prevented this accident in the first place. And the red line is the pipeline from the northern slope of Alaska okay. coming down over two mountain ranges. By the way, earthquake zones just about parallel that red line as well, Oof. loading onto the tankers and then going off down to Long Beach. It is a mega system. And it turned out it had mega problems and the surveillance of this system by federal and state and international bodies was really incredibly complacent. Uh, and that's part of the story as well. So I thought it might be good to go back to a story from 30 years ago and see lessons that could be drawn about resilient, adaptive government, what can go wrong, and what could go right and bring it, guess what, to the two major existential crises that you and I and all of us are currently facing. But we would get there through the Exxon Valdez. This is a schematic of the moment that it hits Bly Reef. Uh, and I guess you know what those white dots are, right? I assume they're icebergs. Yeah. So the ship was avoiding the icebergs, uh, but it avoided a little too much. <laughs> Got too reasons close that, and that's actually, I mean, we can even see that. That was, that looks like some a rock that would have been avoidable. Is that, is this, was it a high tide and they couldn't actually see it? Or, I mean, I'm sure they had instruments, but. Well, the story is that the captain was drunk. The reality is that the ship was being run by a skeleton crew. The only person at the wheel hadn't slept for more than 18 hours and should have had two officers with him and didn't. The captain had had three drinks that afternoon, but we were told he was a better captain drunk than most captains were sober. It, it was an accident that was bound to happen because of the way that the government uh, and the corporation had minimized safety, minimized safety, guess why? Every minimization saved money. And you're looking at the result. Uh, I assume it wasn't a skeleton crew because they were taken out by sickness. It was a skeleton crew because they didn't want to hire more people. The ship was designed for 36 seamen. Guess how many were uh, uh, running the ship at that point? Uh, 12. Yeah, 16. 16. That's still ridiculous. Wow. And, and the, the shore crews that had been in charge of loading it 
had been fired to save a quarter of a million dollars. And so the crew of 16 had had to load the ship instead of sleeping. Uh, do you get That's the idea? That's hard work, I imagine. This wasn't a drunk captain. Yeah. It was Sig, mention, tell us what the captain was doing when, uh, when the ship uh, uh, ran aground. The captain had said to the guy at the wheel, we have to stay away from the ice blocks so you can divert to port to the left side. And the guy did so, but he was so sleepy he put it on autopilot. And the captain went downstairs because he had to do the bursar's records, the treasury, you know, the accounts for the turnaround because the company had fired the bursar in order to save $150 uh, million dollars of, of support over, uh, over time. Um, and it, 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 it was crazy. He was doing an accountant's work. The accountant was being paid something like 75,000 a year, penny wise, pound foolish, billions of dollars. Uh, and you're looking at the results. Uh, the results really were horrible. I don't know, uh, Clayton, you weren't around, but David, you saw these pictures on TV, right? When I was around then, I remember this, yeah. Uh, well, Clayton, you, you were uh, a child, I think, but obviously a sophisticated television. Yeah, I was in high school, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, I mean, but you can see the oiled wildlife mm -hmm. was tragic. It was. But the vast number, of, of wildlife that got oil died. Um, the, the beaches, they're, they're very rocky, were sprayed to clean them. Do you see, I'm on a beach that has just been cleaned so the vice president could walk on it and declare a victory. But if you lifted the rocks and put your hands in, there, there was oil underneath all of those rocks. The, the cleanup, in other words, was something that, that was not going to be done anytime soon. But over on the right, do you, do you see that spray? Um, the hazmat suit and the spray, yeah. Yeah, and, and tell me, if you were spraying with a hazmat suit, would you wear a ventilator or not? Uh, I would think I'd be wearing a ventilator. Yeah. That's the correct answer. Do you see a ventilator there? No. No, you don't. Uh, and furthermore, the dispersant that they're spraying uh, is, is dangerous. One of those guys came over to me and whispered, you know that spray we're spraying? Most of us are peeing blood. Ooh. Said, oh. He said, it's coming through our skin. We're peeing blood. But we don't want to tell the foreman because they'd send us back to the lower 48 instead of paying us. They needed the job, yeah. Our commission learned this stuff and put it into a bunch of recommendations. And remember, David, out of 59 recommendations, 58 were ignored, and they could have stopped the Deepwater Horizon blowout. Mm -hmm. But 20, men, 20 years later, um, all was forgotten. Uh. It's interesting. It's, it, systems, the bigger they are, sometimes the less capable they are of careful management. And so there are lessons to be drawn uh, from that. Uh, part of the lessons uh, we can talk about are prevention before the fact, and you have to prepare for response after the fact. Uh, and this is the ideal, adaptive management, feedback loops, uh, which didn't exist in Alaska, didn't exist uh, with Deepwater Horizon. Plus the non-regression principle. Once you get an advance protecting the public, like the recommendations of our commission, you don't turn around and go in the opposite uh, direction. Even though the pressures of profit often count against uh, public protections. And also, we can say something about subsidiarity. Uh, this comes from canon law, from the church but the decision should be made as low as possible. And guess who knew most about the dangers of a potential oil spill and what was needed to clean up? 
Do you think it was the federal government? Do you think it was the state government? Do you think it was Exxon? Or do you think it was the fishermen, the local people who lived and watched and worked there day by day? Maybe some of those guys were peeing blood. Yeah. Uh, listen to those you're guys. On it again. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's part of what we'll look at as well. Because the lessons aren't just ancient history. This is the curve of CO2 and global warming. And, and look at it. Back in 1965, we knew that this was coming. And we knew how to stop it. And the oil industry knew it was coming and knew how to stop it. And instead, our governing system, but not just in the United States, but internationally, let the curve go the way it's going. And Quincy could be underwater by the end of the century. But, but a lot of terrible things are happening already in Miami. And, 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 and global warming is not just on the seashores. It's, it's all over. And, and so David's group can tell you uh, all of the impacts of climate that could have been avoided if we'd taken the lessons of the Exxon Valdez and its impacts on the weakest populations in terms of political power, uh, as well as on all of us. And then obviously, this is another problem that could have been mitigated, never completely avoided, but mitigated and instead look at the curve. Look at that green curve. That's the United States. And lessons from an oil spill could have and still could make a difference to every one of the people in this audience, to you, to me, to David, and, and to the people who are least possible uh, power power deprived populations that are going to suffer the worst from COVID-19 and the worst from climate. Hey, systemic change is on the way uh, and, and there are lessons to be learned. And so Sig, David mentioned something earlier that you had also mentioned when we were looking at a couple of these final slides here about iron triangles. Maybe you could say, what, what is this idea of an iron triangle? How did that, what, what were the iron triangles? What, what is, what are you referring to when you say that? When I first went to Washington, I was a law professor in Tennessee and I was helping farmers with a case against the most marginal, the last of 68 TVA dams. Uh, and, and it was going to destroy incredible farmland uh, for a corrupt land deal. I mean, it-, it This is the Tennessee Valley so, Authority, right? Tennessee Valley Authority, and, and, and which has done some wonderful things and has done some terrible things. So I went to Washington with a lot of facts and a lot of farmers, and we were trying to get the attention of the government agencies and of the media. And I was told by other public interest citizen uh, representatives, you're up against an iron triangle. What does that mean? I said, I don't know what an iron triangle is. What really runs the government of the United States in every state and probably every nation state in the world is the power of the market economy, the industrial economy, uh, and the power against regul. The agencies are another prong of the triangle. They've been created to represent the public interest against the excesses of the market. And then the third prong is the legislature or a political block in power that empowers the whole thing. And what I found then and what you'll find here, the fossil fuel industry is the most powerful prong of an iron triangle. The agencies that try to control fossil fuel obviously have a difficult time up against the campaign finance paid to the legislature. The legislators who, who, who owe it to the fossil fuel industry, it can make you cynical or it can make you realistic. And we have to be realistic and figure out, okay, we need systemic change. It's gonna come from the media. It's gonna come from the public. 
it's going to come probably from way down, not from way up. Um, and Back to the, let's look at the... Well, there is definitely some hope that if we can listen, and there are lots of people turning out. There are people in, in Quincy, in the Climate Action Network. Um, there's you and your work to help inspire folks. Uh, and I think we see examples all around the world. So while these are incredibly distressing times, um, I think there's also a lot of reasons for hope. So I hope that we can take lessons here and, and, and sound the call so that people do pay attention and look to figure out how do we listen to the voices that are um, seeing the next, you know, rock to the right, to the left of the iceberg. Um, as John, us John Lewis said, when you look at all the forces against the real public interest, there is a way, if you can get in the way mm. of what's going wrong. And, and so uh, that involves voting and thinking uh, the way David's group is thinking, the way all of us have to think. Systemic change is on the way. What looked radical just a couple of years ago is now necessary. Well, I for one certainly hope uh, that we can spur some, some thought and some action. So th I appreciate you helping contribute, David. I really appreciate you and your work. Um, and I'm grateful that we can help bring this, these provocative ideas that the kind of change you're talking about did seem unthinkable even six months ago. But maybe with some of the wake-up calls and the way that people have been affected uh, in our lives, in our homes, uh, in the, these last several months, we are, will come to personally realize that we need to do things differently. And there are different ways where we can care for each other and listen to each other. So I appreciate you lending your voices uh, and, and efforts to this action. Thank you.